One of the most familiar passages of the Old Testament among Christians is Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child will be born, a son will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. Then it continues, there'll be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with righteousness and justice. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, Adonai Tzavaot, will accomplish this. And the names ascribed to the Lord Jesus in this passage, Wonderful Counselor, Peli Yoetz. Peli is a term, actually an adjective that's only ever divinely ascribed or applied in scripture. His name is wonderful. It continues. He's called Pelio Etz, but he's also called El Gabor, God Almighty, affirming his deity. Eternal Father, Aviad, and Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom. Again, a popular verse, a popular passage known to many Christians. But let's look at it in context. Isaiah, like all of Israel's prophets, prophesies for three different time frames. Isaiah prophesies for his own time, the time of the Assyrian captivity being underway for the 10 northern tribes and the impending Babylonian captivity for the southern tribes and during the days of King Hezekiah. He then prophesies for the first coming of Christ, this son will be born. But then he prophesies eschatologically for the return of Christ. And like so many of Israel's prophets, he prophesies for these different time frames, sometimes all in the same breath almost, certainly in the same verse. Let's understand the context. To do that, we have to go back to the previous chapter, chapter 8. We read the following. Verse 6 of chapter 8, after the Lord spoke further to Isaiah, Inasmuch as these people have rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloach and rejoice in Rezin and the son of Remelia, now therefore, behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the strong and abundant waters of the Euphrates, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And it will rise up over its channels and go up over all its banks. Then it will sweep on into the hills of Judah. It'll overflow and pass through. It'll even reach to the neck. And the spread of its wings will fill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. Again, he's prophesying for his own time, the Assyrian invasion. But he's also pointing ahead to events eschatological that will take place in the last days. The waters of Shaloach have to do with Maim Hayim, living water. Jeremiah predicted the people would reject the fountain of living water, this being the Messiah who would give the Holy Spirit. The living water is identified by Jesus as the Holy Spirit in John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39. But it's something that happens before Emmanuel was born. Emmanuel is predicted in the previous chapter 7, verse 14, where it says, a virgin, that is a Alma, will conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. That is, God is with us. So it's Emmanuel's land that's going to be invaded. Well, it was invaded by the Assyrians in the days of Isaiah, but it has, a again, a future prophetic shadowing associated with it concerning the return of Christ. We know this because Isaiah tells us that the government will be upon his shoulder. That was not the purpose of Jesus in his first coming. In his first coming, he was an atonement for sin. It is in his second coming where the increase of his government or his peace will be without end. In his first coming, that simply did not happen. These events 
take place again. There will be some kind of a strategic invasion of Israel that we read about in the book of Revelation chapter 16 and elsewhere. And then the attack will come from the north into Jerusalem, just as it did in the days of Rabshakeh in the book of Isaiah. We continue reading in chapter 8, something else was going to happen before the Messiah comes. When they say to you in verse 19, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? There was a rise of occult activity predicted by Isaiah. That would include specifically necromancy, communication with the dead. We don't think of it this way, but both Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism, as well as Mormonism, have active communication with the dead, or so they believe. Praying to the dead is the sin of necromancy. We pray to the living God. We pray to Jesus, who is risen from the dead. No place in Scripture is the dead addressed in prayer. When it was done by King Saul, it was seen as a great sin. It was seen as an abomination of something we call in Hebrew, makshafut witchcraft. Yet there are religions, sects, denominations professing to be Christian who openly and actively engage in occult practice, including necromancy. But in between these two, we see something else is going to happen before Emmanuel comes to establish the government that will have no end. We read the following in verse 12. You are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy. And you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. Before the Lord comes, we're going to see strategic attacks on Israel. We're going to see an increase in occult activity that will infiltrate both Israel and the church. And we're, we have this in Judaism in Kabbalah, and we have it in Christendom. But we're also going to see conspiracy theories predominating. Conspiracy theorists need not be Christians. There are secular people with no Christian pretense who are conspiracy theorists. There are people who have been clinically diagnosed as psychotic. They're driven by obsessions, actually driven into psychosis by paranoid delusions about conspiracy theories. But there are many Christians who buy into conspiracy theories, which they confuse with end time prophecy and discernment. They become obsessed, once again, with things such as Freemasonry or the Illuminati or secret plans to bring in the Antichrist. When the scriptures speak of Antichrist in the last days, it does not speak of the Illuminati or Freemasonry. Now, it's fine for Christians to be aware about what people say about such things, and reading the testimonies of people saved out of Freemasonry, I'm absolutely convinced it's of demonic in nature and demonic origin, and no Christian should be involved with it. Christians should burn their Masonic books and aprons and have nothing to do with Freemasonry. This is quite clear. But these people who become obsessed with the Illuminati and obsessed with conspiracy theories, there are people in the secular world doing the same thing. What tends to happen with these people is, if you don't agree with them, they take that as prima facie evidence you're part of the conspiracy. They construct scenarios. They extrapolate things that are basically fanciful conjectures with very little hard evidence. Part of the problem with conspiracy theories is that there's always some measure of truth in them. They all have some measure of truth. But then again, people begin to conjecture and extrapolate and speculate and construct a scenario which becomes delusional and they think are real. When this happens among Christians, some of them think that God revealed it to them. This becomes their focus instead of what the scriptures tell us to focus on concerning the return of Jesus. This is the reality. You are not to call everything a conspiracy that these people say 
are a conspiracy. Conspiracy theorists do more to discredit biblical prophecy and to mislead the church than they achieve of a, of a constructive nature. It's simply quite misfortunate and it has no scriptural basis. It's just something that they think or they believe or are somehow convinced has merit. But doctrinally, theologically, and spiritually, it largely doesn't. Again, it's fine to be aware of these things and to know what people say about these things, but it's not the focus of Scripture in terms of preparing for the return of Jesus. We are warned specifically by Isaiah not to call everything a conspiracy that these people call a conspiracy. When we study the subject of prophecy, we must draw a clear distinction between scriptural eschatology and conspiracy theories. The two have become overly convoluted. They have become conflated. One becomes part and parcel of the other. They're in fact quite distinct. These people are emphasizing things the word of God does not. They are devoting their energy and concentration to trying to understand things the scripture places no emphasis on. It's just, at best, a false wisdom, and it's ill-advised. It's not directed of by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit directs us to concentrate on what's revealed about the return of Jesus in scripture. Now, this is not to say there's not conspiracies. The Antichrist is going to plan and scheme. The book of Daniel tells us this. We need to be aware of his devices and what he's going to do. But the text tells us you are not to say it's a conspiracy in regard to all this people called a conspiracy. Another problem with conspiracy theories is when something really happens that is prophetically significant, people will just think it's the lunatic fringe, Christians again, with another conspiracy theory. This is not good. This is a trick. This is something that has gone on too far for too long, and there are too many Christians who ought to know better to be caught up in it. An invasion will come of Emmanuel's land just as it did in 721 BC. That will happen. There will be an increase in occult activity and this will infiltrate the church. This is already underway. But also, conspiracy theories abound. Do not call a conspiracy all that these people call conspiracy.